Revelation 1, John writes, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He goes on to say, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. A friend of mine says John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He was in the throne zone. In the presence of God is fullness of joy. In the presence of God, we take our eyes off of our issues here on earth, put our eyes on His issues. And as Sheikh said, He can sort out our issues as we're focusing upon Him and His beauty. He does not have issues, but issuing from Him is life, abundant and free. Maybe you've been living in the groan zone. Welcome to the throne zone. Lift your eyes up to Him who was and is and lives forevermore. The Alpha and Omega, the A to the Z, the first and the last. The one who's got it all under control. Yeah. We give you all glory. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be praised. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that whoever, that means you, that means me, whoever would believe in Him would not have to perish but can have eternal life. You can leave here today knowing that you're never going to die. Your body may die, but you were gonna, can live on because the free gift of eternal life is available to whoever puts their faith in God's Son. What is this believing in His Son? He gave His Son to come and live a perfect life, knowing that sinful men wouldn't put up with such perfection. And through their jealousy and envy and greed, they would try to wipe Him out. And God allowed it to happen. And that injustice became the payment for all sin for all time. Because the wages of sin is death. It brings death to our bodies. It brings death to our relationships. It brings death to everything we do will die. Sin just kills it. Sin is fun, but the fruit of it is death. If you've been living a life of sin, just look at your life. Look at the fruit of it. If you had enough, the fruit of this, the throne zone, is life, joy, and peace forevermore. God gave His Son to die for you and I. Put your faith in Him and call on His name and say, Jesus! Yes. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are the first and the last. I believe that you are the first. I put my faith in you. I put my faith in you to pay for all my sins. To pay for all my sins. I want to live in the throne zone. I want to live in the throne zone. to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The followers of Jesus were all together and waiting on a promise that he told them was coming. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This was not a tame gathering, was it? They were waiting on the promise, and it came with sound, it came with wind, it came with fire, and it came with uh, supernatural ability to speak in, in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And in Jerusalem at the time, I believe this actually happened 
in the temple because uh, they were daily in the temple praying and seeking God. And so I believe it happened in the temple. And so it was a public place and thousands of people gathered to see what was happening, this fire, this wind, and these languages. And this happened during a Jewish festival when Jews had come in from all over the world to celebrate the giving of the law. And here the Holy Spirit was given, which I love that. He uh, gave the Holy Spirit to write his law in our hearts. So now we no longer live by the commandments on some wall somewhere, but by the commandments that he's writing in our hearts. Who knows that when you do wrong, something in your heart says, "Uh uh-uh. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you and to me. And so they were amazed and wanted to know, what is this? How are these people from Judea speaking in our language? And it lists over 15 different nationalities there. And Peter gets up and begins to preach. And as a result of his sermon, they're convicted and they say, what should we do? Verse 36, he ends his sermon with these words, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. God's still calling, so the promise is is for us. We are those that are far off. And with many other words, he testified, verse 40, and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. That day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly. Can we say steadfastly? In the apostles' doctrine, that's not a bad word. It means teaching, in the teaching of the apostles, what did they teach? Jesus commissioned them in Matthew 28 to go out and make disciples, baptize those disciples, and teach them everything he commanded. So you read what Jesus said in the Gospels, that's what they're teaching, these new believers. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear or great respect came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. They really loved each other, didn't they? Keep in mind this church grew from maybe uh, 120 to 500 people to over 3,000 people in a day. Wow, wonderful. But with church growth comes new problems, right? If our church were to explode in growth, you'd lose your favorite seat. You'd lose your favorite parking space. And hopefully you wouldn't go looking for another church, but some people do that. You'd lose your elbow room and all that other stuff. But they had serious problems because their visitors or their guests or their new members were from out of town. And not just out of town, but from another country. They had traveled for weeks, months, days to get to Jerusalem. There was no church in their home. They wanted to stay. Where the, they wanted to stay in the throne zone, and they equated it to Jerusalem at the time. And so the church lived like this for seven years, lived communally, not as a commune, but lived communally where people sold what they could to help meet needs of those who had a need. Uh, who's ever been on vacation and you ran out of money before you ran out of time? And so this was like a vacation. They went to this festival, and they were running out of money. They had needs. And so sometimes they would run back home and sell stuff and then come back and help establish the the beginning of the church with their resources. Verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So the church grew in this atmosphere of love and caring for one another. I'd like to speak to you this morning on the subject, Love Cares. We're going to be on the theme of love for a while. Love Cares. Can we say that? Love Cares. Let's pray. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would speak to our hearts. 
Show us, Lord, where our love is strong and how we're to keep it strong. And so show us, Lord, where our love is not so strong and where we need to risk loving people with our hearts again. In Jesus' name, amen. Love cares. What we read a while ago in Acts 2.44, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily. So the church grew. Two chapters later, the church grew to over 5,000 members. And it speaks there in Acts 4 of that season in the church. The multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. They really loved one another. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. This was something that was generated from their hearts. It wasn't some cultic policy or some communistic government. The Holy Spirit was doing this work in their hearts. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. Let's say nobody lacked. Nobody lacked. All needs were met. Maybe, maybe they had some wants, but their needs were met. And this was true because the atmosphere of love was there. Christ had demonstrated his love to them in an incredible way on the cross and an incredible way on the resurrection. They could walk by and see the empty tomb and and rehearse the story of the gospel. So the love of God was very real to them, and their love for one another was very real for them. And they lived during difficult times. They were an occupied country living under an oppressive empire, the Roman Empire. And hated by non-believing Jews. So, you know, they lived in difficult times. But they were able to encourage one another, strengthen one another during this awkward time in their life. You know, sometimes awkward times aren't real so bad because they keep you dependent on the Lord. You may be there right now. God, you're having to depend on the Lord's strength every day. There will be a day you'll come through this. You'll have a breakthrough. You'll have... Some miracles happen. Just hang on. But there will be a time when you may look back on these days and miss them. You know, I was so dependent on God. He was so close then. And of course, the Lord will say, I didn't move. (laughs) So give thanks in all things. Draw near to him. Continue living in the throne zone. He'll help you with your groans. Ephesians 4, we read this a couple of Sundays ago, talks about Jesus giving some to be apostles, verse 11 to 13, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. This is what was happening during those days of steadfastly continuing in the apostles' doctrine. They were equipping them for the work of ministry. And here's a result of the work of ministry, for the building up or the edifying of the body of Christ. And here's... How it's to happen It's to go on. People are to be equipped for ministry, for the building of the body of Christ, until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Who knows? We're not there yet. To a perfect man, we're not there yet. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So until we fully become all that Jesus has saved us to be, we have a job to do. We've got a ministry to fulfill. We have a calling to be equipped in. That's what church is about. It's continuing the ministry of Jesus and being equipped to fulfill that ministry. Because you and I have ministries that are unique to one another and no one can fulfill our callings except us. You have shoes to fill, yes, right there in your home and flowing from that in your job, in your neighborhood, and wherever wherever you go. Verse 16 says that from Jesus... The whole body, through this ministry that goes on, the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So if you imagine the church being an expression of the church universal, a local church being the expression of the universal church around the world, as his expression... 
We are his body. And as his body, we are individual parts of that body. We're not all ears or mouths or eyes or fingers or toes, but we are all parts of that body. And as we do our part, the body is healthy. If we don't do our part, the body's not so healthy, right? And so it is in the church. If we do our part, the body will grow through the edifying of itself in love. The word edifice in the Greek, it means to build up. A building is an edifice. And so where each part of the body does its part, that is, we fulfill our ministries and we grow in those ministries and God raises us up to fulfill even more ministries and other things, growth happens individually and corporately and in our families and in every way. But this all happens in an atmosphere of love. And so one of the aspects of love is care. Love cares. You know, the opposite of love really isn't hate. It feels like it sometimes. But in reality, hate is just an unhealed hurt or hate is, hate could be love that's been scorned. And so it manifests in love. The opposite of love is indifference. When you stop caring, that is a concern. If it's real love, it will care. That's why hate isn't necessarily the opposite of love, because if you hate somebody, you care. You don't want them to do so good. You actually care about, the, about whether or not they do well. But indifference doesn't care. So my point today is love cares. And if we're to be a people of love, we're to be people of care. And so with that, I, I want to say this. As a church, we want to care. We want to care for your needs. We want to care for one another's needs. We don't want to just have sympathy for each other, but we actually want to do things to care. And so one of the things we do because we care is we endeavor to make our children's ministry a safe place. And so we have a strategy. Some might call it a security system. But it's basically a safety strategy to make our children and youth ministries a safe place. Those of you that entrust us in ministry to your kids, we value that. We recognize we do not replace you. We only are here to enhance you. We are here to support your ministry as a parent because you're the one called to disciple your kids. So with that being said, if you'd like to be involved in children's ministry or youth ministry or you are involved in children's ministry and youth ministry and have not been through our hour-and-a-half to two-hour training session, you're invited to come here this coming Sunday at 2 o'clock. And also, because we care, we want to pray for people. At the end of this sermon, you're going to have an opportunity to come and receive prayer from our prayer team. And we have a strategy for that as well, as to, as to how pray prayers, how to minister to people more effectively. And if you'd like to be on our prayer ministry team, you've not been through our training, we invite you to meet with me here this coming Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. Amen. Sorry for all the commercials. Love cares. Our five points today are an acrostic. Love cares. C stands for community. A stands for action. R stands for risk. E stands for empathy. And S stands for selflessness. If you're going to be a person who cares, if we're going to be a church that cares, we're going to be a church that lives in community. We're going to be relational people. We're going to be a church of action. It's going to be more than just trying to feel good, but we're actually going to be doing things. And if you care for somebody, these, these are the aspects that happen in the life of a person who cares. You're going to be willing to take some risks. You're going to have empathy, and you're going to be selfless when you care for someone. If these aspects aren't involved in your life, you don't really care. So I believe everybody here cares and wants to care. So these things are going to be part of our life. First of all, let's begin with community. God said in Genesis 2, verse 18, it is not good, it is not good that man be alone. Data collected from 148 studies involving over 300,000 people conducted over 30 years shows just how true this word is. People who have no social life are 50% more likely to die early than those who are well-connected. 
Those who socialize regularly with family and friends live an average of three to seven and more years longer than those who lead isolated lives. Bert Yacino, the professor who led the research at two universities, said friends and supportive people encourage us to have better lives. He went on to say that the emotional support people receive from those close to them can help them put their problems in perspective. He said, by having secure relationships and feeling loved, people live more securely and more calm lives. You need community. Tell your neighbor, you need community. Watch this. More and more, our society is becoming isolated. We run from work to home. Shopping may be the necessary evil or may be the pastime where you want to be left alone, let me have my fun. Sometimes we may even go home and push a button and drive into our house like a tortoise going back into its shell. Sometimes church may be an outing where when it's over, you're out of here as soon as they say amen. You're being ripped off. You're missing out on community. Separate yourself from the world of isolationism and step into community. The moral content of old school friendships was a commitment to virtue and mutual improvement that is being lost in today's culture. We have ceased to believe that a friend's highest purpose is to summon us to the good by offering good advice and correction. We practice instead in America the non judgmental friendship of acceptance and support of everything going on in our life. Meanwhile, nobody's saying, Shipwreck! <laughs> Stop! Because we don't want to lose the friendship. We walk on eggshells with one another. We seem to be terribly fragile in this country. A friend fulfills his or her duty, we suppose, by taking our side. Agreeing with us always, validating all of our feelings, supporting our every decision, helping us to feel good about ourselves. We make excuses when a friend does something wrong and, and do what we can to keep the boat steady. We want our friendships fun and friction free. That's not true friendships. The Bible says iron sharpens iron, so a man will sharpen the countenance of his friend. With the social networking sites of the new century, the friendship circle has expanded to become even more shallow and embrace the whole of the social world and in so doing, destroyed both its own nature and that of the individual. Friendship itself is at risk. Facebook's very premise and promise is that it makes our friendship circles visible. 
but yet it's being dumbed down to the state of whether you like or unlike something. There they are, my friends, on my Facebook page, all in one place, except, of course, they're not in the same place, and they're not necessarily in the same time. And they may not even be your real friends. They're just friends of your friends. They could be a superficial likeness or a pretend semblance of somebody pretending to be who they are, and they're not. Little images and information are no more my friends than a set of baseball cards is the New York Mets. Living in community is so important. I'm a Facebooker. I'm not slamming Facebook per se. May it enhance your friendships, but may it not substitute it. I have a friend who really wasn't my friend on Facebook. It was one of his friends pretending to be my friend. And uh, he was a married man wanting to get to know some hot chicks that he knew from his younger days. So he pretended to be his friend. But every picture that popped up of my friend, he had his shirt off. (laughs) Like, does this man ever wear clothes? Turned out he was just trying to attract the wrong attention. Turned out it wasn't my friend. It was somebody else. So be careful out there in the cyber world. Love cares. And love that cares involves community. It also involves action. James 2 says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? First John says, whoever has this world's goods and see his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. If you're going to love somebody, you're going to care for them. And if you're going to care for them, you're going to act. It's going to be some doing involved, some action. The love we see coming out of Hollywood isn't real love. There's no action. They can't stay committed to one another. They betray each other. It's a very self-centered love. It's lust, really. Lust is pleasing yourself at someone else's expense. Love is pleasing others. At your expense. So love involves action. In 2009, a Time Magazine article shared a startling statistic about Japan. It said that one in five Japanese men and women have seriously considered taking their life. And every year over the past 10 years, more than 30,000 people each year kill themselves. With this troubling statistic in this Time Magazine article was a story of this guy, Yukio Shije who has helped at least 188 people choose life over death. Every day since 2004, CJ, a retired detective, has roamed the Tajimbo Cliffs, a popular site for suicide attempts along the coast of the Sea of Japan, looking for people who are considering jumping. If he spots someone in need, he slowly approaches them, offers a gentle hello, or how do you say it in Japanese? Konnichiwa. And then does his best to engage them in some conversation. At some point, CJ will softly say, you've had a hard time up until now, haven't you? The beauty of CJ's work doesn't end there, though. He'll often take them back to an office where he encourages them, offers them counseling sessions, and food. Toward the end of this article, the writer mentions that the ringtone for Shijay's cell phone is set to Amazing Grace. This guy's a believer, which seems to be the perfect choice. Shijay sums up his mission this way. I want Tojimbo to be the most challenging place, not where life ends, but where it begins. Love acts. Love cares. And to care is a life of action. Love also risks. Love also risks. We preached this three weeks ago about the story of the Good Samaritan. It says that as the Samaritan journeyed, he came where this wounded man was. There was a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho and he got beat up. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal 
and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day he departed. He took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, when I come again, I'll repay you. This guy took a risk. He risked his safety by stopping in an unsafe area along the highway. He too could have been robbed and left wounded and bleeding and naked as well and broke. He risked his time and he risked his resources by taking him to an inn and paying for the innkeeper to take care of him. And he even risked his name by saying, if there's any more needed, when I come back, I'll pay that too. You cannot care for anybody without taking a risk. The priest in this story and the Levite in this story weren't willing to risk anything. And they passed by because their risk-free lives, which is an illusion really, was their priority. They were uncaring. They didn't walk in love. So love that cares is a love that risks. Check out these guys. You just want to keep pushing yourself. You want to see how far you can take it, how long you can stand the heat without killing yourself. Everyone's stuck in a rut, man. We just got tired of the same old thing. No. No lid. Yeah, I am willing to die for this. I mean, I don't want to, but no lidding is a way of life. It's how I became a man. Extreme coffee drinking is the ultimate, man. It's just the ultimate adrenaline rush. Yeah, you know, I got these sissy sippers coming up to me all the time saying, you're crazy and you have no fear. I've had third degree burns over 75% of my lips. We're no litters, man. It's what we do. It's who we are. Look at that, man. Hey, look at that. Superheated to 450 degrees. No lid, no coaster. Wobbly gas. And the most important stack of papers I've ever done for this company. Woohoo! Adventure, baby! That's why we get out of bed in the morning. be a normal person, have a normal cup of joe, I didn't work. There's no risk. There's no adventure. What's life without adventure? Little humor there to get across the point. A risk-free life is a very shallow life. And that's not the kind of risk that we're after. That's just stupid. <laughs> Love that cares is the love that's empathetic. Empathy. This is the blessing of going through hard times, is it will develop an empathy you wouldn't have otherwise. You ever known somebody that was judgmental of other parents till they had their own children? You ever met somebody who was judgmental of parents of teenagers till their children became teenagers? Paul wrote in 2 Timothy, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted. So he comforts us in our tribulation so that we can comfort others who are in tribulation. What is that? That is that that is the operation of empathy. The message Bible says he comes alongside us when we go through hard times, and before we know it. He brings us alongside someone else who's going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. Empathy. There's a plague in our nation called EDD, Empathy Deficit Disorder. The word empathy is defined in Webster's as the action of understanding, being aware, and being sensitive to, and even vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experiences of someone else. With that definition in mind, Douglas LeBeer, director and founder for the Center of, of Adult Development, feels that many of us are unempathetic to the point of it being a catastrophe. While discussing his theories, he said, we unlearn whatever empathy skills we've picked up while coming of age in a culture that focuses on acquisition and status more than cooperation. In short, we value moving on 
over thoughtful reflection. Another psychologist adds that if our typical responses to people's pain lines range from it could be worse or let's talk about something else or let's talk about me, the question is, are we suffering from empathy deficit disorder? How is your empathy? Is it like the priest of the Levite towards the beaten man? Uh, he should have known better. He should have been carrying a stick or he should have left earlier or later. Obviously, we all could do things differently that would prevent problems. But just finding the cause of someone's problem doesn't help them, does it? It's rather cold-blooded. God forbid that we should have to be wounded naked and bleeding in some ditch somewhere before we are empathetic for someone in the same. May God cause our hearts to be softened. And finally, love that cares is a love that is selfless. Philippians 2 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of of others. Concluding illustration on your $50 bill is this guy, General Ulysses S. Grant, U.S. Grant, a great man from Galena, Illinois, became President of the United States. This statue is in D.C. on the east side of the reflecting pond. When the sun rises, the Capitol's shadow falls on this statue of U.S. Grant on his war horse. Two and a half miles away in another park is this statue, a lesser-known man, General Rawlings, John Rawlings, also from Galena, Illinois. And he was instrumental in helping Grant succeed because Grant was a raging alcoholic, had a serious drinking problem, Rawlins helped keep him sober when he needed to be. When he would be tempted, they would get together, and Rawlins would help Grant overcome his problem, if not before a season, so that Grant could succeed. Grant would not be who he was were not for Rawlins willing to be selfless. What a hero. What an awesome deal. You do not know the greatness that is in you that will only arise as you become more selfless, helping other people to succeed. Popular culture doesn't know who Rollins was, but history knows. That's how I found out about it. He's one of my new heroes. There's greatness in you and I, but it doesn't become... Reality, by our trying to be great, but by our willingness to serve and be selfless. Can we stand? Lord, I pray that you would help us to be caring people in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to receive all the care that you have for us that we need to receive from you so that we can give the same care to others. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that as we transition the service now, if anyone needs to receive caring prayer, that we would be faithful as a prayer team to pray for them and that they would be bold enough to come and receive prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. In a minute, I'm going to ask the prayer team to join me across the front here. And if you'd like to receive prayer for healing, for salvation, for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, for wisdom, for anything, for your relationships, for your finances. We care, and we want to pray for you. And so right now I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward, and as they come forward, just come forward with them. Come on up and receive prayer. Amen. Come on up, brothers and sisters, to pray for those who would like to receive prayer. Lord, 
bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. May you demonstrate His love by caring for people like never before. May selflessness be an adjective that describes me and you. Praise the Lord. Come and receive prayer. God bless you. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I want what you